Thank you all. Thanks for that introduction and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Ryan Kazansian. I'm a technical director with Mandiant. I'm here with Matt Hastings. Um, and uh, yeah, we're here to present uh, investigating PowerShell attacks. So thank you all for coming. Um, before we get kicked off, quick show of hands. Um, how many of you have used PowerShell, written anything, even a couple of lines of code or commands for a functional purpose, like doing something productive? Cool, wow, that is a lot more than I expected. I think if I asked that question two or three years ago, maybe a third of you would have raised your hand. Um, how many of you used PowerShell to hack something? Not surprisingly, quite a few of as well. Okay, cool. So, yeah, this, this is kind of what the impetus for our... I don't know. ...job um, creations um, for Mandiant. So we do incident response work, forensics, um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And most of what we do is uh, focusing on targeted attacks. So large, complex breaches, highly targeted, um, and in many cases, um, in, uh, compromises where an attacker has been persistent in a victim environment for a very long time. Because if you put the investment into breaking into an environment, um, you want to stick around there as much as possible and, and try to remain undetected. Um, and so we were working a case that began um, early this year in January. Um, Fortune 100 organization that actually had been compromised for over three years, um, which actually is not terribly unusual in the types of cases we work. Um, the attacker, like in most investigations we perform, had um, domain administrator access, so they owned the Windows environment. Um, and even worse, they had authenticated access to the corporate VPN um, due to the way they were using um, an insecure multi-factor mechanism for authentication. And so by virtue of that, for over three years, the attacker was VPNing into this environment like a normal employee would, and then conducting command and control from their own machine to systems in the internal networks from the VPN pool. Um, and the command and control mechanisms they were primarily using were things we see all the time for lateral movement, like scheduled tasks. Um, and then a lot of PowerShell. Um, in fact, there was a point at which the attacker almost shifted entirely to using PowerShell scripts and PowerShell remoting to conduct lateral movement, um, to uh, exfiltrate data, and achieve their mission. And we quickly learned that this becomes forensically very difficult, especially if you have an environment with 50,000 plus systems and an attacker that's, again, logging in straight through the VPN. So this was what drove us to do this research and figure out what are the forensic artifacts left behind and how can you track this down. Um, if you aren't too familiar with PowerShell, um, and you may be wondering why use PowerShell, like isn't it just another command shell? It's, it's incredibly powerful. Um, it can do almost anything, and that's really not an exaggeration. Um, you can load, um, you can access the entire .NET framework. Um, you can reflectively load DLLs. You can interface with basically anything in the Windows API. So it's not just like a souped up batch script, it's much, much more powerful. Um, and that gives attackers a lot of flexibility. Um, it's also why there have been quite a few attack tools that have been developed that use PowerShell as their code framework, um, the most well-known of which is PowerSploit. And if you haven't tried this out, I suggest going on GitHub and checking it out. PowerSploit's amazing. It lets you do everything from, well, pretty much every stage of the attack lifecycle, reconnaissance, code injection, um, DLL injection. Um, there's a Mimikatz module that reflectively loads Mimikatz into memory on a remote system without ever hitting disk. Um, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but yeah, there's lots of other attack tools now that also use PowerShell. Um, Metasploit added some um, PowerShell uh, modules to the, uh, its payloads a couple years ago. Um, and many more of these are continuing to be developed. Um, similarly, uh, there's also a lot of mass malware that's now using PowerShell. Um, the first PowerShell malware was actually seen in the wild as kind of a proof of concept in 2006, the PowerShell worm. Um, but really, this started to get traction um, just a couple of years ago. Uh, we have a few um, highlights of, of stories here from Trend Labs. Uh, there was a ransomware sample um, that locked a bunch of your files and used PowerShell to conduct some of its stuff. Um, there was a, a file infector that targeted Word and Excel documents that, again, used PowerShell for propagation. Um, so the bottom line is targeted attacks are using it, mass malware is using it, um, and from investigators, again, this is a challenge. So what we wanted to do is basically take away the details of you know, who is using PowerShell and for what purpose and get to the fundamentals, which is for each way that you can possibly interact with a Windows system using PowerShell, what sources of evidence are left behind. And so the three um, scenarios that we tested were local execution of a PowerShell script, um, PowerShell remoting, uh, which uses the WinRM protocol, and persistent PowerShell, which is basically just taking some scripted code and configuring it to automatically load on a system upon user logon or reboot. And for each of those scenarios, we basically tested what sources of evidence are left behind in places where we always look when we examine a system, on the registry, um, on the disk, in event logs, uh, in memory, and even over the network. 
Um, we also made a few assumptions that are based on what, again, we see in the real world. Um, so for the purposes of what we're talking about, we're going to assume the attacker has administrator access to the victim environment, um, either local admin on the box they're trying to compromise or domain admin to the entire Windows network, meaning that we're talking about use of PowerShell in the post-exploitation phase of an incident. The attacker's already gotten into the victim, and now they're not concerned with that initial um, compromise. They're concerned about moving laterally, getting to the systems that have the data that they want, and persisting in the environment. Um, all of this stuff that in the classic attack lifecycle diagram is kind of in the middle. Um, also, you may be familiar with some of the uh, controls that Microsoft puts in place to limit PowerShell execution, like by default, um, Windows won't run PowerShell scripts if they're not signed. Um, and by default, in certain versions of Windows, PowerShell remoting is disabled. Um, but with command line arguments, it's trivial to bypass both of these. Um, so they don't really inhibit an attacker that's already achieved this level of access. Um, finally, and this is, we're not going to read through this entire chart, but this is a quick reference for version numbers. Um, PowerShell 2.0 is installed by default in Windows 7, Service Pack 1, and Windows Server 2008 R2 and greater. So if you have either of these operating systems installed, you have PowerShell installed on your systems already. Um, we're going to refer to a few subsequent versions of PowerShell. Um, 4 is the latest release version. There's actually, I think, a um, beta release of five now in the wild. Um, but as you can see, all of these require updates that are optional um, in older versions of Windows and are the defaults in more current versions of Windows. Now, practically speaking, um, we don't see Windows 8.1 in the wild and don't expect to see it in corporate networks for quite some time. Uh, a lot of organizations we're working with, at least in the US, but even abroad, are only now starting to finally get off XP and go to Windows 7. So, for the practical purpose, we're going to refer mostly to PowerShell 2 because that's the lowest common denominator and what we see attackers expect is that's what they're going to find in most environments. All right, so for the first part of sources of evidence that we cover, we're going to talk about memory analysis. Um, and the idea with memory analysis is to try to solve the worst case scenario. And the worst case scenario in a PowerShell attack is I'm a bad guy on host A, I'm trying to laterally access host B, and I'm only using PowerShell remoting to do so, meaning I'm not writing any scripts to disk on the target system. I'm simply using WinRM and the built-in remoting capabilities of PowerShell to remotely execute code on that system. And if that is the case, we want to determine, given access to that accessed system, to take you know, a forensic image to grab memory, how much is left and how long does it stay there? How easily could you reconstruct what happened? So to go through this, we kind of have to understand a little bit about how PowerShell um, works and how the services that underlie it work. Um, and we'll begin by looking at the process hierarchy for WinRM, the Windows Remoting um, uh, Service. So um, there's an instance of service host that runs the DCOM launch service. And if you're a client interacting with a remote host with PowerShell remoting, and you're using the invoke command commandlet to just run a binary on the system. So let's say I already have evil.exe on this target host, and now I want to execute it. Um, what happens in that situation is svchost.exe running the DCOM launch service will spawn a child process, um, an instance of wsmprovhost.exe. Um, it's the web service management something host process. And that in turn will spawn a, the child process for whatever you're trying to run with invoke command. Um, so these are the three processes that get run in sequence. Um, SVC host running DCOM launch starts at boot, so that's always running. Um, in contrast, if I use PowerShell remoting to execute a native commandlet or to run a local script that executes commandlets on the remote system, so the two examples we have here is using invoke command to run um, get child item C, just returns a directory listing of what's in C, or using the PowerSploit invoke mimikatz script on my client system uh, to dump credentials on a remote system. In either case, um, what happens is Another instance of WSM prov host gets spawned immediately upon the connection, and the PowerShell code actually runs within the context of that process. So there is not a spawned instance of PowerShell.exe on the access system. The PowerShell code runs within this WSM prov host. Um, so those are the processes that are running. Um, what gets left behind in memory? So the nice thing is, just like the command shell, there is a shell history maintained during a PowerShell session, but it is limited to the lifespan of that session. So if you grab memory from WSM prov host during a remoting session, you can recover a command history of what ran during that session very easily. Now the problem is if I do a one-off command via remoting, or even if I do an interactive PowerShell session, 
the moment that ends, that history goes away. It's flushed out of memory. Um, and practically speaking, as a forensic responder, I'm not going to get to the system during that split second where the attacker happens to be interacting with it. We have PowerShell. So we quickly realized that we're kind of out of luck when it comes to that entire chain of processes. We're not going to recover any evidence. So what we then looked at is, all right, what else in the stack of things that are used when you remotely execute PowerShell on a system, and um, what might they have in memory? And what we found is that um, the instance of SVC host that is running the WinRM service actually contains remnants of the SOAP that is used to encapsulate PowerShell objects during remoting. And that actually, because this runs again during startup or login, um, persists beyond the end of a PowerShell session. It's not a complete history, but it contains remnants of recently executed commands. Um, we also found bits and fragments in the kernel and page file. So what we, we did is we put together this chart, um, and this is meant to kind of summarize in memory how long will evidence remain. Um, Again, your best source of evidence, WSM Provhost, is almost never going to be available to you because of the short lifespan of that process in memory. Um, what we found, though, is the SVC host for WinRM will contain um, fragments of remoting input and output and commands and the responses to those commands, um, potentially for many hours or even until the system is rebooted. The only dependency is how many interactive PowerShell sessions occurred on the system. If there's a lot of remoting activity, you may only get bits of the last set of commands that ran rather than a full history. Um, similarly, kernel memory and page file are pretty unpredictable in terms of what's going to be left behind. What we saw is that there was a limited amount of data that you'd sometimes see in kernel pools that were probably marked for paging um, that had bits of the same type of data we saw in SVC host for WinRM, um, but we weren't able to determine with any sort of reliability that you're going to recover command history in, those, in, in kernel memory or in page file um, in most cases. So let's look at a few examples here. Um, and hopefully this is readable. I apologize for the colors. Um, in the first quick example here, we're echoing a very simple distinctive string, test string, PS session uh, to an output file. And uh, hopefully you can read it. This is a big blob of ugly soap uh, in which, among other things, is the PowerShell command GUID and then the command itself um, contained within WinRM memory. So we're able to recover that. Then we tried something a little fancier. We used invoke mimikatz from PowerSploit. And then we grabbed memory from the uh, system that had been compromised via this script remotely um, about five hours later. And we found even five hours later in the WinRM service memory, uh, we had the uh, complete syntax of the command that was used um, to reflectively download and execute invoke mimikatz. Um, so again, we were able to figure out that happened. Um, finally, and, and we added this because uh, I actually saw an attacker do this in, a, in an investigation I'm working right now. Um, they did this about a month ago. They were using uh, invoke mimikatz, but in this case, I'm, I'm just showing you an example with a simpler command where um, they base64 encode it. So, and I'm not even exactly sure why PowerShell supports this. I guess it's so that if you have special characters in your command, they get escaped properly. But you can pass PowerShell a uh, base64 encoded Unicode version of your command, and it'll execute it. So the attacker um, encoded his command, and I use a simpler example here. But what I was curious about is, well, you know, if you do an encoded command on the access system, what will be in memory? Will it be the base64 version, or will it be the decoded clear text version. And it turns out it's the decoded clear text version. So we pulled memory on the target host. And you can see here that amidst all the garbage, we have echo test string and coded string. So um, the decoded representation was available in memory uh, on the access system after it ran. So th the bottom line here is you know, if you get a memory image of a system, hone in on that WinRM service host process. Um, but that's still a fairly large process memory space to trudge through, and you don't want to just kind of eyeball it. Um, what we found is the best way to search for this stuff and get a, a starting point so you can kind of pivot around keywords is to look for some of the syntax that is used by WS Man and the Microsoft um, PowerShell remoting protocol. Um, so these are some of the things that you'll find around commands. And RSP command and RSP command line are, are definitely the most um, targeted. If you find this in memory, you will probably see bits of commands that were executed via PowerShell um, around where that string is in, in the bits of memory or data you're looking for. Um, if you have attacker file names you know about from other investigative work you've been doing in the same environment, you can certainly search for that. Um, the bottom line is this is, is a painful search, but at least you can scope it down a little bit by limiting the process memory that you're going through. So in summary for memory analysis, 
this is always the case, timing is everything. Um, it is not easy to recover this evidence, but we wanted to basically prove that even in the absolute worst case, you would be able to recover at least a subset of activity um, after the fact if an attacker conducted a remoting session um, and didn't drop anything on the accessed host's disk. So um, variables, again, include system uptime and memory utilization, um, as well as the volume of WinRM activity. The nice thing is in most environments we look at, you won't typically find that every Windows system is being subject to a high volume of WinRM activity. It might be a couple of your servers, but like your Exchange servers, but um, the systems the attacker is interacting with via PowerShell may not be ones that you, for administration purposes, typically use PowerShell to interact with. So WinRM memory ends up being pretty pristine on a lot of systems. So with that, I'll hand it off to Matt to talk about uh, event logs. Thanks, Ryan. Hey, everybody. So in the next section, we'll be covering event logs as our source of evidence, and we're looking at, at two key scenarios. Uh, one that Ryan just went over, and that's where an attacker interacts with the system remotely via PowerShell, and then we'll also look at what, what remains for local PowerShell execution. And really, we differentiate between the two because the sources of evidence or the logs that we'll be reviewing are different among both. So the first question that we'll answer are, what are our key sources of evidence, or which logs should we really be reviewing? So if you've ever looked at the event logs on a Windows Vista or a later system, there's tons of them outside of the core system security and application logs. So where we focused here are on the specific logs that wrote directly related to PowerShell activity. And what I mean by that is other logs that may write indirect evidence uh, associated with the activity, we really didn't focus on. So for an example of that is uh, in a remoting session, we'll focus on specific remoting uh, event logs. What we won't look at then are the other like security log entries, so the, the associated logon. Um, that's obviously going to be there and should be investigated, just not really part of our, uh, our research. The next is the level of logging detail or what you can come up with based on what's available in the logs because it definitely differs by the options you've set in the logs that are available. And finally, we'll look at the differences between PowerShell 2.0 and 3.0. Uh, starting at 3.0, there's a lot more available to the user as far as uh, command level logging. Uh, in 2.0, we'll see that it's fairly limited. Uh, so first, let's look at the actual what logs should we focus on ourselves. And so um, the first, the application logs, the PowerShell EVTX log, the operational log, and then for remoting purposes only, the WinRM operational log. Uh, we also have two analytic logs here. If you look down here, these are analytic or debug logs. They're disabled by default. Uh, so we, in our research, said, you know what, let's turn them on, let's see if it gets captured. And it's actually pretty interesting of, of what you can get out of it. Um, but then it's also pretty limiting in, in how you have to go about pulling out the evidence. So the first log that we'll talk about is the, for local PowerShell execution, the PowerShell log itself. And there's two events that we found to be sig forensically significant, and that's EID 400 and EID 403. And what you'll see if you read the event itself, it's saying the engine state for PowerShell has become available, and then correspondingly the engine state has come, uh, has stopped. So what you can infer from this is this is the bookends of PowerShell activity. So given these two event generated times, you can say, okay, well we know that PowerShell was running during these times, let's go to see what else happened on the system during this time. So we should review the file system, let's look at the registry, let's look at other event logs to try and piece back activity. But what this isn't showing you is the specific commands that were run. Another thing that you can get from these logs, if you look here, the host name console host, that means that PowerShell was run locally. This will change based on the type of PowerShell interaction that's going on in the system, and we'll look at what a remoting lo session looks like uh, in a further slide. Uh, continuing with local PowerShell execution, the PowerShell operational log, which really writes a lot of redundant events to the, to the PowerShell log that we talked about on the previous slide, we didn't find too much forensically significant data here, um, with one caveat, and that's specific to PowerShell 3.0. So in PowerShell 3.0, if there's an error that occurs, a verbose log message is actually written here. So here we see EID 4100, um, and you'll see that this file failed to run um, because it's, it cannot be loaded or scripts are being disabled and they didn't bypass it on, on the command line. But what you can get here is a detailed, a detailed error that includes the file that failed to run. Uh, a similarly, uh, this event will capture if, a, if it fails to connect out to a remote system. So if you're, example, looking at an attacker system, that they use to initiate a remoting command and they failed to connect somewhere, you'll get the IP address or host name of the system that they attempted to connect to. Moving on to the analytic logging, um, this is again specific to PowerShell 3.0 or greater. There are some um, interesting commands here, so, or events here. So EID 7930, 7937 actually captures specific commands or scripts 
uh, built-in commandlets or if they just launched uh, a file itself. Now what you don't get from this is arguments. So if you ran dropper.exe and you have no idea what dropper.exe is, you're not going to see the commandlets that help you, the commands or arguments passed to this executable that might help you infer what it actually did. And again, analytic logging generates a ton of events and it isn't really maintained or meant for long-term event logging. Um, but the, when we turned it on, it does generate a ton of events, some of which were useful. And we actually go into it in the later slide how you can um, piece out specific commands that were executed if you turn on analytic or debug logging. So moving now to remoting, um, back to the PowerShell log, EID6. Um, and then you'll see here, same to what we saw before, um, creating WS man session, the connection string is yada yada yada, PS version. So you get the PS version here, and this will also tell you the starting of a, a client remote system, but we already have that information. Similarly, back to the same EID 400 and 403 in the PowerShell log itself, the same bookend events are written here with the host name now server remote host. That tells you that this is a remote session that was invoked with PowerShell. So now you can kind of start to understand how uh, a user or an attacker was interacting with the system. So Brian mentioned this before, but PowerShell uses the WinRM service for all of its remote command execution. So the, the WinRM operational log also contains forensically significant information. EID 169 captures the, the user, so in this case it's Matt H, as well as the type of security um, service used for the login. So here it's NTLM, and you can see who is connected. And this is really useful, for example, let's say security event logs have rolled at this point because in a lot of cases what we'll find is we'll come into investigation and security logging is not what it should be or object access is enabled and for whatever reason security logs have rolled pretty frequently. So looking for other sources of evidence here can tell you at least an account that may be compromised that was being used for PowerShell. And again, EID 84 and 134 gives you another, another source for bookending the activity of PowerShell. Not really giving you the specific command history that you might be looking for, but at least it gives you an idea of what you could find or the time frame of which this activity occurred. Continuing with the trend of remoting, now we're back to the analytic log. Remember, this is disabled by default. And I mentioned about the number of events that it actually captures. So one thing that we found pretty quickly is, um, first of all, it captures the username, which is nice. It also captures every single piece of data that's sent to or responded from the accessing and access system, which includes the initial protocol negotiation and every, every piece of command and every response that's sent. And it's written in an encoded fashion and is not directly linked to one another. So you have to piece back together exactly what happened by encoding, by decoding them individually one by one. So what does that look like, right? So um, starting here, this is a, a sample event log. So you'll see this is a receiving remote fragment. So this is data that's being received from the remote host on the access system. And this is what it looks like. So it's, it's hex encoded data. So once we decode it, um, what you'll see here is the command that we ran is invoke command get child item C. Um, and in all this, again, it's XML just garbage. You'll see this command get child item is script nope. And then down here you'll see C. So we're looking for anything in the root of C. So decoding it, you can see specific commands that were run. But again, this is, if you look at here, this is object ID 5. This is mean this, this is the fifth message that it's received with data. And now you're just receiving the command itself. So you've already parsed through five before this of garbage data before you get to what you need. So going back then, okay, well, this records both the what was received and then what was responded with. So let's look at what it looks like when it responds. So one thing about PowerShell is every time that it responds to you uh, from a commandlet, it responds with an object. And everything, similarly to other coding languages, everything is an object. So in this case, everything within the root of C is a unique object and then it is written as that in the event log. So for every child item in C equals an event in the event log. So this is a single, drivers, which is the directory within C. So this is a single event that you would have to parse out and then you get one item. So then you'd have to parse every single event of this response in order to get the full capture of what was sent to and received from this command. So there's a few other options aside from the event logs of how you can capture this type of data and one being profiles. So if you're not familiar, PowerShell has the the option for creating profiles for both global users or for every user that launches PowerShell as well, well as specific users on the system. 
this is the path to the specific profile for every, every user on the host. And what it does is it loads code that's it within this profile on startup of PowerShell. Now one caveat here, you can easily bypass this with a no profile flag and PowerShell is happily just steps right over this, doesn't load any code. But if you do use this legitimately, you can add code to the global profile that lets you um, use built-in either PowerShell command lines, like start transcript, which actually records command history um, and writes it out to a log for you. Um, or you can actually, we've seen some custom code that overwrites the default prompt function, so it captures first everything that's inputted to and received from the command line, and then it, you can actually write it out to an event log itself. You don't have to write it out to clear text. PowerShell gives you the option to write it out to an EVTX file. Uh, again, some limitations here. It's not gonna run for PowerShell remoting. This is only when PowerShell.exe is launched locally on the host. Um, and like I said, you can launch this with a no profiles flag and this, is, and this won't get loaded or recorded. Uh, another option is AppLocker. For anyone not familiar, AppLocker is, uh, is Windows built-in application uh, whitelisting service. So this allows you to set certain paths or certain files that are allowed to run on the system. Um, but beyond a block mode, they also have a monitoring setting and they also monitor for scripts. So you can set to either audit or enforce, enforce uh, script execution. So in this case, we've set it to just audit. And what you see is you actually capture the user and the script path of what was run. So here we're able to see that the path from the user that launched this script here. Okay, so starting in PowerShell 3.0, there's a concept called modular logging. And this is really where we get to the the answer to this question of where can we get command history written to the event log. Uh, and so when Microsoft or Windows provided that to us starting PowerShell 3.0. So the first thing you have to do is configure modular logging to tell it which modules, are, which modules of PowerShell do you want logged. And they give you some nice help features though. If you want, you can, uh, it accepts special characters. So you can say, okay, just give me dot star, which is basically all built-in PowerShell modules will now be logged at the command or in the event log itself. So here's what it actually looks like. This is a, a more complex command because we're actually piping um, output from one commandlet to a second commandlet. And so here what we're doing is we're getting, the, we're getting all child item of ctemp recursively and we're filtering just for text files. And then we're passing that array of text files to select string which is basically grep for the term password. And what you'll see here, and I'm not gonna go into this in too much detail, it, it all gets broken out uh, into this nice command message uh, you get the username and the command name of the original commandlet, uh, and this is 4103 in the operational log. And then subsequently, you get the nice output. So here what we see is the output of this command, not only just the input, and it says, okay, well, here's the, uh, here are the results in the actual text that we found uh, from the results. And we'll see how this looks in a minute because it actually can record some pretty cool stuff. Now, one thing to keep in mind is when you turn on module or logging, it will log every single command issued to, the power, issued to PowerShell. So Ryan gave this example earlier and we'll come back to it. Here's the invoke Mimikatz script. And what we found is it has used over 1,200 commands to PowerShell, which then corresponds to 1,200 events being written in a, a matter of like three seconds. It's ridiculous. So once you finally parse through all of these and you get to the output though, it's really interesting because you'll see the actual Mimikatz output, which contains all clear text passwords in the event log itself. <laughs> so if you ever see this, this is really bad. <laughs> Um, so really in closing, before we move on to the persistence, um, PowerShell 3.0, uh, if you can run it in your environment, a lot of organizations that we found just don't have it. Uh, PowerShell 3.0 is the way to go for, 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 command, for detailed command auditing. Uh, you can use things like uh, analytic logging, but again, it's really not intended for long-term purposes. So we recommend upgrading to 3.0 and turning on modular logging. And then Ryan's gonna go over some persistence mechanisms. Thanks. All right, so the, uh, the last bit of what we wanted to cover is um, sources of evidence to find persistent PowerShell um, installed by an attacker. And of course, the idea behind persistence, um, you know, we see this in almost every type of uh, investigation we work. You know, attackers want to have malware that automatically runs upon boot or log on, you know, something like a keystroke logger or a backdoor or anything that you need to keep running on a system. Uh, and so what we wanted to determine is, um, are there any persistence mechanisms that um, are specific or are, are particularly well suited to PowerShell? And again, what are the sources of evidence that we can use to find them? Uh, what we're not gonna talk about are the common techniques because one of the easy ways you can persist PowerShell is the same way you persist any other malware. Um, you can use the dozens and dozens of registry-based auto-run type keys. Um, you can use 
uh, recurring scheduled tasks. You can put something in a startup folder like a script that launches PowerShell.exe with an argument. Um, all of these things have been very well discussed and documented in prior forensic research and work. Um, there are tools out there like auto runs that automatically enumerate many of these. And so we're actually not going to focus on these for our purposes. Just do be aware that you know, running PowerShell.exe with a script argument is just like running any other sort of malware. And so all of these techniques um, are suitable for persisting. Um, but one thing that we uh, found that um, is particularly interesting uh, is WMI. Uh, and WMI is actually one of the persistence options available in PowerSploit framework. And because PowerSploit is so popular, we wanted to, to focus on it for that reason. Um, WMI in general is really good for persisting um, anything that you can run via a script. And so we wanted to, what we're going to talk about here is um, not specific just to PowerShell. You can use WMI to persist all sorts of malicious code. Um, but PowerShell works really well with it. So the idea behind WMI is automatically launch PowerShell upon a common event. I mean, I say event because um, WMI is really complicated, but it's basically this eventing subsystem in Windows that is comprised of things called filters, consumers, and then bindings which connect the two. And you can actually create these filters and consumers with PowerShell itself. There's a module called set WMI instance that will do just that. So you can use PowerShell to create what we're just about to show you. You can also use PowerShell to enumerate it. So let's explain a little bit more about what these filters and consumers are. So a filter, you can think of it simply as like a search or a query. Um, it's basically I want to create a condition that I expect will occur on a normal Windows system on a periodic basis so that I achieve persistence. Um, I have a, two examples here that are both options uh, that PowerSploit provides by default. Um, these are not the only types of queries. They're written in WQL, Windows Query Language. Um, and we have one example here that um, it looks kind of SQL-ish, um, is looking at the system uptime. And so the WMI subsystem is continuously polling this. And when it sees that the system uptime is between 240 and 325 seconds, it decides, OK, it's a certain amount of minutes after startup. Go ahead and trigger my consumer. Um, another way you could achieve the same sort of thing is on a clock schedule. So instead, we have this example here that runs the um, consumer bound to this filter at 12 o'clock. Again, two examples, you could, there are many, many different variations of filters you could use to achieve the same thing. The bottom line is I want to create a query that reliably will execute with whatever interval I want my malicious code to run. Uh, the consumer is the thing that gets launched when the filter is triggered. Um, in our case, we want to launch PowerShell.exe. Um, but of course, that's not good enough. If I'm an attacker, I need to make sure PowerShell runs the bad code I want it to run. And so the way they achieve that is they have to put the code somewhere. Um, and there's two different ways you can do this. Uh, one is actually used by um, PowerSploit, which is you can store it in a profile. So as uh, Matt alluded to earlier, um, there are both user-specific and system-wide PowerShell profiles. And if I put malicious code in the profile, then when PowerShell.exe executes, the profile code will automatically launch. And you can do tricky things like you know, add a lot of space padding so that the malicious code is kind of hidden from view if you just like threw open profile.ps1 in, in Notepad. Um, but the bottom line is I'm basically just automatically running code just by virtue of running PowerShell.exe. Um, so here's an example, um, and there's, you can do native like compression in PowerShell. So here's an example of a, a payload dropped by PowerSploit that gets put in the user profile to automatically run. Um, another thing that you can do, uh, and again, you can take advantage of PowerShell's inline support for um, de decompressing and then executing uh, encoded commands, um, and simply put the PowerShell command line you want to run with the code in the consumer's command line arguments. So when you create a consumer, you can do more than just say run PowerShell.exe, you can include arguments. And as long as your arguments are short enough to fit within the Windows command line length limit, which now I'm blanking on it is, I think it's like 800 characters or something, more than enough space for uh, some compressed code. Um, you can just add it directly to the consumer, which means the script isn't written to disk anywhere um, on its own. It's actually stored among all of the other WMI objects on the system. And forensically, this becomes really hard to recover. So let's say an attacker does this and sets the malicious PowerShell code in the command line arguments for the consumer. How would you find it? How would you even find a malicious filter? Um, the first thing you could do is use PowerShell. So um, PowerShell provides a method called getWMIObject, 
and you can enumerate all the filters, all the consumers, and all of the bindings that link the two together. And the nice thing is if you do this in your environment, you'll find that there's a couple of defaults that you're going to find on almost every Windows system. And then for the most part, it'll be clean. So you can get a sampling of what one of your normal images look like, and then find anything that is anomalous that sticks out, because most systems will have a predictable identical set of um, WMI event filters and consumers. So in this example here, we have a uh, get WMI object to enumerate a consumer, and I can see that um, I have the command line argument for PowerShell.exe and then some code that's cut off. Um, so very simple example of using PowerShell to get this evidence. Um, the problem is you have to do this on the live running system. So what if someone hands you a disk image? Um, if someone just hands you a disk image and says, I think someone installed a malicious WMI event filter and consumer, um, you're going to have a bad day because it's very hard to reconstruct this. Um, I've spoken with people at Microsoft. I've talked to a lot of people that are much smarter than me, and there is currently no mechanism for taking the dead w, um, WBAM file. So there's a couple of files that um, store all of the WMI objects on a system. Uh, there's, they're all in this directory, system32 slash WBAM slash repository. Um, objects.data, index.btr, and then these mapping files. This is an undocumented um, format. It's a very complex file format. We've had some of our reverse engineers look at it and say, yeah, this is a bag of hurt. I'm not going to touch it. Um, but the bottom line is there's really no good way to examine this on a system and determine what WMI filters are installed. The best you can do is um, strings it and then look through the strings. Now, the nice thing is if you strings it, objects.data does actually retain the WQL for the event filters and the command line templates for um, the consumers in clear Unicode strings. So I have some ex excerpt here from objects.data strings and we can see we have a WQL to run the consumer at a specific time and then we have again a cutoff instance of a command line for running PowerShell.exe. Practically speaking we found that um, it's pretty rare to find um, WMI consumers that are running PowerShell.exe with arguments on a normal Windows system. So even just the presence of that string in a uh, objects.data uh, might be a good tell that someone set something up. But you, you definitely have to baseline your environment and determine if that's the case for you. Anecdotally, from what we've investigated, it's, it's pretty distinctive. Um, other things you could look at on disk, um, the profile files themselves, uh, if you're examining a system that you suspect had PowerShell activity on it, um, always look in the profiles. Um, even if the modification dates don't line up with known attacker activity, it takes a few seconds to look inside each profile file and determine is there code in there or not. Um, finally, we looked at the registry. Uh, we were really hopeful that the process of setting a WMI filter and consumer would leave evidence in the registry because if you do Windows Forensics, you know, the registry tracks a million different things. And we actually found that there's no evidence left behind in the registry. We even observed it with Procmon. When you set a WMI filter or consumer, there's no key you can go to and just enumerate that, um, that information. What we did find, though, is at least one specific event filter, and this is one of the defaults that PowerSploit uses, um, the one that executes code at a specific um, time of day, will create a registry key and value under it at this path, uh, and the, the, the key is called Win32 Clock Provider. And that is not common. Um, we've examined tens of thousands of Windows systems during our investigations, and I've never seen this key show up unless someone creates an event filter that uses a specific time of day to run something, a consumer. Um, and so that's a good tell that someone used PowerSploit with the default WMI options. I'm sure there's some legitimate case out there where this could also be created, but the key is not common, and it's not in a default install of Windows otherwise. Um, obviously, again, the caveat is this only is created when setting that one specific type of WMI filter. There's obviously many types of triggers that I could use to achieve the same purpose. Um, and then finally, other sources of evidence. Um, SysInternals auto runs as a version 12, um, enumerates the WMI uh, objects repository. Again, you have to do this on a running system, so it's not going to help you if you have a disk image, but if you are pulling data from a live system, it enumerates all of the WMI filters and consumers, and then it does the thing auto runs usually does, like it gives you the MD5 hash and the digital signature of the consumer binary. Um, so that's very handy. Um, we looked in memory uh, briefly to try to figure out if there's any sort of memory forensics we could do to reconstruct this. Um, there probably is a bit more research that can be applied here, but um, because the WMI subsystem is so heavily used by 
applications and components of the operating system itself, it's very, very noisy. And we weren't able to find any easy or reliable way to recover evidence of a malicious WMI uh, filter or consumer to run PowerShell through memory analysis alone, especially if you don't know what you're looking for up front. Um, and then finally, there is an event log uh, called WMI trace. Um, it is, again, like the other trace logs, not enabled by default. It will capture when you create a filter or consumer, like in this example, I created a consumer named totally legit WMI, and it created a nice event log entry for that. But the problem is you will get events generated in this log every second. So the likelihood, again, of you proactively looking at it and determining whether something bad happened is very low. And similarly, even if you had it enabled, um, it will roll, ver roll very quickly just due to the volume of events Windows generates. Um, so again, your, your best bet if you have access to the live system, the simplest thing you could do is, is auto runs. And the next best step after that would be Again, just using the native um, PowerShell commandlets to enumerate WMI objects. So I'll go ahead and wrap things up. Uh, we definitely didn't cover every single piece of evidence that's available to a forensic investigator on a system. Um, however, we did release a white paper along with our presentation that's available online. I think it's both posted on the FireEye website and uh, I believe Black Hat has it posted on the website as well. And it goes over um, some additional sources of evidence as well, as well as some of the sources of evidence that we covered in the talk just in more detail. Um, but just at a, a high level, briefly, I'll walk through some of the additional pieces of evidence that you could potentially look at, depending on the situation that you're in and depending at the, on the systems that you're reviewing. Uh, the first being prefetch. So if you're looking at a Windows workstation uh, and prefetch is enabled and PowerShell has been run locally, there's a good chance that a prefetch file was then created uh, for that PowerShell execution. And so from that, you can draw a few different conclusions. You can get the, the first time that PowerShell was run, by the creation time of the prefetch file, you can get the last time PowerShell was run because that's stored within the prefetch itself. And then most, interestingly, most interestingly, you can pull the access file list from PowerShell.exe within the first 10 seconds of execution. Those are the access files that get written within the prefetch itself. And so depending on the nature of activity or what was being used with PowerShell, you could potentially get the name of scripts that were run with PowerShell, uh, potential files that were accessed that could give you an idea of what's being run. The next item here, I actually would never have put this on here if I hadn't seen this has been used. So the execution policy setting we've alluded to before is what is enabled by default uh, and prevents users from just double clicking unsigned scripts that run um, using PowerShell. I said it's trivial and Ryan mentioned it also that you can just bypass this with an execution policy bypass flag. Uh, when you launch PowerShell, it's very easy to do and PowerShell is then is happily to avoid avoid whatever is set in this registry key and then run whatever you want it to. It's really not meant as a security mechanism, um, but what we saw in one case during the investigation that Ryan was talking about earlier, the attack actually modified this setting rather than just setting it at the command line. I think they just got bored of hitting EX tab and then they just got tired of it. So they set it in the registry when it was the only system in the entire environment that had a different registry setting than everyone else. So it was really easy to spot. So if you know in your environment that your execution policy is set to restricted or, or signed only, you can go look for anomalies there and then investigate, hey, why was this set to this way? Uh, and who knows what you'll find. The other thing that we didn't really cover is network traffic analysis. And this goes back to how WinRM functions. So WinRM functions over two ports. 5985 and 5986 respectively using HTTP and HTTPS. And don't get excited, even if it's running HTTP, the actual commands are all encapsulated and encrypted. So all you're gonna get from the HTTP is some of the header information that includes the version of PowerShell being run, which can be useful. So in the same investigation, the attacker is using a different version of PowerShell than what they were using internally within the, the company. So they set up snort rules that alerted any time that that version of PowerShell was seen running over the wire. And from that, they were able to capture some of the command and control activity and identify systems that the attacker was accessing. Um, and finally, this is something that we just added here, Sysmon. Has anybody used Sysmon yet? A couple people? Anybody like it? It's pretty cool, right? Yeah. So Sysmon captures, it has the options of capturing three different screens. The first one is process creation, which Windows has an option to do that by default. But what you get from Sysmon is you get the process creation with all the command line arguments passed to it. You get the hash of the, uh, the file that was launched. You get the parent process name and parent process ID as well as some other information. Um, so really key things there is you get the MD5 hash of what's being created, of, of what's being run, as well as the, the full command line arguments. 
The other thing that it captures is when a file's creation time changes. Uh, and the thought there was they were trying to capture a time stomping on a system. The only problem with that, if you've looked at it practically, is this happens uh, all the time and it's not malicious. So when I turn it on on my system, it's alerting all the time. And the final thing is it actually logs all network connections, which can be really beneficial, but it also can generate a lot of noise, especially on end user workstations. So you just see like IP address of Reddit over and over and over again. So <laughs> it depends if you want to use it. But what you can get from Sysman, Sysman, like I said, command line argument. So if so you see PowerShell.exe, you're going to get the full command line arguments of whatever was passed. So whether that be a script or the full command that was executed, you'll see those. One thing that you're not going to get, and this is from um, Sysmon and with PowerShell or the command line itself, you're not going to get if PowerShell is launched and then commands are typed within the shell itself, Sysmon's not going to be able to capture that. So that's, that's really the one thing that it's not able to do for you. But beyond that, it is a, a really cool tool that was just released last month from Sysinternals. Uh, and finally, here, here's some of the, just the lessons that we've learned from our research and what we've seen work and not work in the field. The first thing is upgrading to PowerShell 3.0 and enabling module logging, if, if that's possible. I know in a lot of corporate environments, it's just not possible because along with that, you, it's a full patch. It's not like you just deploy PowerShell. You have to update to the Windows Management Framework 3.0, and it's, it's a, within a patch itself. Uh, the second thing, and this could be tricky in some organizations, is to baseline what legitimate PowerShell activity looks like. So if you know that my admins run PowerShell and my admins are always sitting in this class C subnet, so looking for PowerShell activity outside of that class C subnet or from users that you wouldn't expect to use PowerShell remoting or onto systems that you wouldn't expect PowerShell remoting to be used. Or looking at if a script is run, is it run from a standard path? Do we always name our, you know, our PowerShell scripts 1.ps1 or do we name it evil.ps1? And looking from a, an anomalous perspective of what's being run on my system, from what users, um, what subnets, is it coming from my VPN space? So that could be a red flag there. Like if, if VPN addresses at night are running PowerShell remotely in the network, why is that happening? Is that an admin in China or is that something else going on? Um, and then just, like I said, recognizing artifacts of any type of anomalous activity after you completed the baseline. So in closing, uh, we wanted to just thank a number of people that helped us out with this research, both um, at Mandiant, at Microsoft, and um, elsewhere. Um, there are a lot of folks out there that have been doing really cool work on both the attack and the defense side in PowerShell. Um, I'd also like to say that, you know, what we're describing here is, is, is definitely depicts a lot of problems and challenges with PowerShell auditing. But, you know, if you think about it, um, the, the Windows native command shell, command.exe, uh, poses similar issues, right? There's no native way to get a detailed history of every native command executed in a command.exe shell. Um, I can turn on process auditing, but if I run the dir command, that doesn't get logged anywhere. There's no easy way to re forensically recover that. So PowerShell wasn't necessarily initially designed to have this type of auditing. The fortunate thing is they're now adding it and aware of it. So um, one thing that's just been released is the version 5 beta of the Windows Management Framework in PowerShell. And they've further improved module logging from what's in 3.4, so that instead of getting a single logged event log entry per command lit, you now have actually have them grouped in, in chunks. And so it makes it even easier to review logs and examine evidence of activity. So um, the good thing is uh, the, the good folks at Microsoft are very well aware of the need for better auditing as more attackers start to use and exploit and abuse this. Um, and so I can expect that to continue to improve. Um, the other thing that you have to keep in mind is all of what we're talking about, again, does assume post-exploitation. So the best control is always obviously don't let the attacker get local admin or a privileged domain account in your environment in the first place. I can't do remoting from one host to another if I don't have valid credentials or sufficient privileges to laterally move or if I have physical or host-based firewalls preventing me from just arbitrarily going from point A to point B anywhere in the internal network. So a lot of the um, security control hardening that we talk about with any type of targeted attack um, activity definitely applies here as well. Um, so once again, thanks to uh, all these folks that we listed here for helping us with our research, and thanks to you all for coming uh, and attending today. Um, we're very happy to be at this conference and um, looking forward to meet and talk with you throughout the next two days. If you have any questions, um, please feel free to come up and chat with us now, um, or you can shoot us an email, um, and we also have our Twitter handles on there as well. But thanks all, and uh, have a great conference. Any questions now?
Yes, so the question was, if you use invoke command to run evil.exe on a remote system, would a prefetch file be generated for evil.exe? And the answer is yes, assuming the remote system is a workstation, and um, yeah, it, w it would be. It would be on the remote host, not the local one. Any other questions? Cool, all right, well, thanks once again.